Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex White. I'm chair of the IIEA's Energy Working Group. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this event, which is part of the Rethink 2021 lecture series brought to you by the ESB and the IIEA. Throughout the course of this past year or so, we've been convening international thought leaders, uh, renowned energy experts and political leaders to address a wide range of critical issues in energy policy. And the quality, I think, of our contributors has been high and the response uh, from our audience has been really universally positive. And on behalf of the IIEA, I would like to thank the ESB for their generous and continuing sponsorship and support uh, for this series. From the 31st of October to the 13th of November this year, the United Kingdom hosted the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties, the COP26 in Glasgow. The summit was a, a chance and important opportunity to evaluate the extent to which countries are taking the actions needed to limit global warming to 1.5, as outlined in the Paris uh, Agreement. COP26 President Alok Sharma said that the summit and the Glasgow Climate Pact had succeeded in keeping 1.5 alive, albeit with a weak pulse. Uh, today, we've convened a distinguished panel of speakers to hear their assessments of COP26 and the direction of international uh, climate action. It's a great pleasure to be joined by Professor Morgan Bazilian, Connie Hiddegard, Alicia O'Sullivan, and Dr. Uh, Sinead Walsh. The event will last for about an hour and a half, 90 minutes or so, no longer than 90 minutes. I'm sure people have plenty of other things they need to be doing, even in the middle of a storm, um, but it'll be no longer than, than, than 90 minutes or so. We'll do it in three parts, broadly speaking. In the first part of the seminar, we'll hear the individual reflections of our panelists uh, on COP26. Uh, we then have a discussion amongst um, uh, our, our panel group, our guests, before we turn, most importantly, to you, um, our audience, uh, to address questions or observations that you would like to offer to this uh, important debate. And we do really encourage your contributions, your questions, your observations. You can join the discussion using the usual Q&A function right there on Zoom. Um, you'll see it there at the bottom of the screen. You're well used to it at this stage. Feel free to send your questions in. I always say this, we always say this, send in the questions when they occur to you throughout the session uh, rather than waiting. And because sometimes we have a difficulty of all the really great, insightful, amazing questions all coming at five to the hour just when we're about to finish. So once they occur to you, pop them into the uh, Q&A function. Please uh, identify yourself when you're asking a question or making an observation and your affiliation, I'm gonna say party affiliation, your organizational affiliation if you, if you have one. And if you don't, that's fine. But if you're representing an organization, you might just mention that when you ask your, when you ask your question. A reminder that the whole event is on the record and you can join the discussion through Twitter uh, also by using the hashtag, hashtag WeThinkEnergy, uh, if you'd like to do that. But anyway, before all of that, it's my great pleasure to hand over for the first time, not for the first time to Paddy Hayes, because he joined us before, but to Paddy, for the first time in his capacity as chief executive of the ESB. And Paddy, I know, um, will be preoccupied, his organization preoccupied with many things on this particular day. And we're absolutely delighted that he has um, had the opportunity to, and thank you again for all your support, but in particular for joining us um, this afternoon to offer some opening remarks. The, over to you, Paddy Hayes, chief executive of the ESB. Alex, thank you. Uh, thank you very much and um, for those warm words and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And on behalf of ESB, I'd like to wish you all um, a very wa warm welcome to what is uh, the final event in the 2021 Rethink Lecture Series. Uh, I'd like to thank the IIEA for hosting the series and for putting together a wonderful lineup of speakers, not only today, but over the past year. Um, for us in ESB, Having a platform where experts can share insights on the climate crisis and discuss potential solutions is absolutely critical because we know that only by working together and mobilizing our shared resources and by building on one another's ideas will we be able to affect the changes necessary to eliminate carbon emissions by 2020, uh, 2050 and, uh, as Alex said, maintain global warming to under 1.5 degrees. 
So Ireland has shown uh, real leadership and ambition in its 2021 Climate Action Plan. And at ESB, we're very conscious of our role and responsibility and the role of other energy organizations as agents of change in this. Um, within ESB, our purpose is focused on the UN Sustainable Development Goals relating to infrastructure, to the provision of secure, reliable and affordable energy, and of course on climate action. And we know that decarbonizing electricity has a significant impact in its own right, but that this is then magnified by the use of that clean electricity in heating and transport and industry. And each part of our business is very much focused on investing in this at the moment. Uh, through ESB International, ESB also operates at the moment in over 20 countries across the globe. So we're really clear as well that the outcome of COP26 is important, not only for, for Ireland, but for all nations and particularly for the least developed. And uh, as I hand back to Alex, I'd just like to say again, congratulations to the IIEA for bringing together a really distinguished panel for this afternoon. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Take care. And back to you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Paddy, for those opening remarks. Um, let me turn to our first speaker uh, for some brief opening remarks, um, maybe about five minutes or so uh, in each case. Uh, Professor Morgan Bazilian is the director of the Payne Institute for Public Policy and professor at the Colorado School of Mines. Previously, he was lead energy specialist at the World Bank. His work has been published in Science, Nature, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, uh, these are all the titles of um, journals, as you'll appreciate, and Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Previously, Professor Bazilian was a senior diplomat at the UN. He has served as the EU's lead negotiator at, uh, on technology at previous UN climate negotiations. Professor Bazilian, as many of you will know, is also a member of Ireland's Climate Change Advisory Council. So we're delighted to have you, Morgan, this afternoon. And over to you for some general reflections post COP26. Alex, thank you very much. Uh, I'm deeply honored to be back at the IIEA. It's one of my favorite places in Dublin and to be involved in an ESB supported event, a company I admire a great deal. Just a quick special thanks to Jill Donahue who does amazing things at the Institute and to the memory of our friend, Brendan Halligan who first invited me into its doors. The, 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 the COP had a terrific set of champions and wonderful branding and marketing. The UK government made a profound investment in its success and they should be congratulated for it. I also believe that in some ways this nod to pomp and celebrity had negative implications for aspects of the talks. Several important things happened over the days in Glasgow. The role of the private sector companies and finance houses was clearly fundamental not just announcements about their actions, but the concrete work that's taking place. It's both admirable and desperately needed. As usual, there was too much blah, 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 as Ms. Thunberg rightly pointed out some weeks prior to the event. Refrains of moving from ambition to action have been repeated so often as to be utterly hollow. Despite this, the Irish can be proud that our country not only came with its own long-term net zero goals, but is doing the much more difficult work of making detailed plans and policies to meet them. That is rare and utterly essential. I've said many times that I thought the Biden administration in the United States needed to arrive with considerable humility to the talks while still showing the world that they are back to the table. I do not think that they heeded my advice nor accomplished that balancing act. Still, the U.S. can take much credit for one of the more important coalitions formed at the talks around methane emissions, and that is a key contribution. The negotiations themselves largely conducted the work in front of them in terms of the Paris rule book and Article 6 and the other detailed topics. But while Paris was widely and often praised, it represents the reality and limits of what the U.N. talks can do, create frameworks for voluntary pledges. And that is fine and good, but should not be mistaken for globally binding agreements. Mm. Perhaps most importantly, the massive gap between rich and poor was on clear display. Those issues are deeply entrenched in global inequality and inequity, and not only in the climate arena. 
but they are in stark contrast to the good paths attempted to be sown to address climate. And the truth is that poverty allevi alleviation remains the top priority of many of the world's countries and peoples, not climate change. Thinking otherwise by OECD countries leads to a muddled approach and too many missteps. Here again, the Irish can be proud. The work done by Dr. Walsh and her team, as well as Ambassador Nason's team at the UN Security Council recently is nothing short of world leading. Thank you again, Alex, for inviting me on this impressive panel and pending COVID issues. I hope to come back to Ireland this summer with a group of doctoral students to learn more about the cutting edge work taking place in the country. Thank you very much and for being so faithful to the inner around five minutes of opening remarks. That's that's terrific. It's great to, to, to have you, um, Morgan, and we look forward to um, the discussion uh, as the as the uh, webinar proceeds. So it's a pleasure now, great pleasure to welcome Connie Hedegaard to the IAEA. Ms. Hedegaard is chair of the European Commission's Mission Board on Adaptation to Climate Change. Um, which is an important element of the Horizon Europe Research and Innovation Programme. She serves as chair of the OECD's Roundtable for Sustainable Development. She's chair of Aarhus University. From 2010 to 2014, Connie Hedegaard was European Commissioner for Climate Action, as many people on this call will, of course, know. Previously, she was Minister for Environment and Minister for Climate and Energy in Denmark. Connie, you, you have the floor and you're most welcome this afternoon. Thank you so much, Alex, and thank you to the IIEA for uh, the invitation. I think I'm uh, pretty much on the same pace where, when it come, page when it comes to sort of the takeaways, my takeaways from COP26 as what we just heard from uh, Professor Bazilian. Um, of course, it did not achieve enough. Having said that uh, then, I, I really believe that it could have gone much worse. I mean, in light of the COVID-19, uh, the geostrategic situation, the finances not having been delivered from the developed countries in line with what was pledged back in Copenhagen in 2009, there were so many things that could have soured that cup. And yet I think that it really managed to, to create some real progress. Uh, I must say, I'm a bit puzzled that the developing countries uh, accepted an end document only talking about that they urged the developed countries to deliver the financing pledges by 2025. I would have thought that that would sour things quite more than, than what was the case, the fact that they embarrassingly did not deliver what they had pledged. Having said that, I think there are many things that we can sort of see as positive with this COP. First, for the first time, science was not questioned. Those of us who have attended many of these COPs, we know that normally there are a handful or more of spoiler nations. This time, that was not so. On the sad background, of course, that everybody sees that now climate change is for real, but it sort of means that everybody is now sort of discussing the house. So that was a good thing. I think, as was mentioned, the rule book was done good with that. I think we saw that the ambition mechanism worked, the mechanism that every five years we will have to look each other into the eyes and say, OK, if you are doing your part, as you have promised, I will also do my and maybe I can do a bit more in line with innovation, taking up pace in line with prices coming down in line with uh, technologies uh, developing. We saw that work with EU, with the United States, but with really, really many countries, actually now more than 140 countries have sent in their national uh, uh, plans, the NDCs. And I think one thing deserves to be mentioned, the engine uh, performance in Glasgow. I mean, having attended, I think 14 COPs, where India most of the time has said, not our problem, it's the developed countries creating the problems, it's not for us to sort of weigh in. And here, Prime Minister Modi stood and announced that by 2070, they would be climate neutral. And by 2030, more than half of the power generated in India would stem from renewables. I really think that was a real significant game changer that an economy like India weighed in like that. On the US-China thing, maybe we will come back to that. It was very, very well spun, I must say. So far, we haven't seen 
what is the content in it, but what it says is that this spring, they will sit down and really have a substantial dialogue on methane, among other things. And of course, that is a significant signal at a time where US and China really cannot have constructive dialogues on too many things. Just finally, uh, what I also think was really important was the many action streams and alliances being formed in the periphery of the COP. Uh, the methane alliance has been mentioned, uh, forestry, the beyond oil and gas, the face down coal, uh, coal initiative, uh, the initiative on buildings, the initiative on transportation and the end of combustion engine. To me, that signals that we are moving from this rules and articles and words into the house. And maybe that is the most interesting thing of what we saw in Glasgow. And just very final point, I know that blah, blah, blah has already been mentioned and one can get extremely frustrated with this slow UN process. I have to say though, that when you have followed over the years, we also see that when first words are into these documents, like for instance, now for the first time, the cold face down, then it is as difficult to get it out and after some time, it really starts to generate real action and it starts to direct the, the way investors behave. So in that sense, I also thought that it was actually key that cold face down was mentioned for the first time. Thank you very much for those insights. Very interesting. Just in terms of how you measure progress, there's a whole debate always about how do you measure progress? You know, is it, it can be, three steps forward, two steps back, you've still got momentum, you're moving forward. Anyway, we'll come back to some of that when, when we're having our discussion. But thank you very much for those, for those uh, thoughts, Connie. I'm delighted to welcome our next speaker, uh, Alicia O'Sullivan. Ms. O'Sullivan is a law student and Quercus Scholar for Active Citizenship at University College Cork. She represented UCC and World YMCA at uh, COP26 in Glasgow. Previously, Alicia represented Ireland at the first UN Youth Climate Summit. She's also served as an ocean ambassador for Ireland and is currently the environmental officer at UCC Students Union. Over to you, Alicia. You're very welcome. Thanks, Alex. Um, and thanks so much for having me here. I'm glad that I can bring, I guess, some sort of youth perspective um, to the conversation. Um, I suppose I want to start with... Um, just something I wanted to note is that when I returned from COP, I guess many of my friends and family and peers and people I spoke to, they couldn't believe that I was there for two weeks. Um, and people often wonder um, and, and probe me, I guess, about why I dedicate so much of my time and energy to it. I mean, as a young person, as someone in, in uh, third level, uh, I miss time with my family. I miss time from college. I miss time with my friends and doing normal 20 year old things. Um, and it's kind of been that way since I was 15. Um, but the only answer I can really give is I do it because I feel responsible. I sat four years ago listening to my friend Selena from the Marshall Islands stand on a stage and talk about her, how her parents' graves were submerged in water. I sat at COP listening to young people talk about how their six-year-old brother had died from water pollution uh, or their friend was murdered trying to protect their home. And it sickens me. It sickens me to know that people are purposely not only destroying our environment, our biodiversity and, and people's lives, but actually profiting from that as well. Um, and I, I certainly can't sit back and watch that uh, for any longer. And, and I don't think um, anyone here should either. Um, but I suppose the big question is, since returning from COP, I've been asked hundreds of times, how was it? Um, the only word I can ever express is exhausting. Um, now, don't get me wrong, as kind of aforementioned, there was certainly positive from COP, um, many of them, um, like the agreement to curb emissions of methane, um, the committing to phase out coal power, um, the pledge to halt and reverse forest loss um, and land uh, degradation, um, the, the pledge to uh, in public financing for forest protection between 2021 and 2025, uh, and crucially as well, the Paris rule book being finalized, which means countries can uh, essentially watch other countries, uh, what they're doing, 
and what they said they would do in regards to emissions and funding. Having said this, though, unfortunately, uh, it's my belief that 2.4 degrees is, is not at all good enough. Um, many negotiators call the agreement a compromise. And I, I don't understand how we can compromise uh, with the climate crisis and essentially compromise people's lives. Uh, it means more heat waves, more crop losses, more water shortages, more unindated coastal cities, more disease and conflict, conflict and millions more suffering. And already 166,000 people have died due to heat waves between 1998 and 2017. A huge issue at COP as well was the exclusion of Indigenous peoples and those from MAPA uh, communities and areas. COP26 was the most exclusive COP to date. Um, I guess some of that was um, quite difficult with COVID-19 that obviously increased with vaccine inequalities um, and travelling and, and, and such. And, and there was, I suppose, a barrier that, that created immense difficulty that was, was almost impossible to overcome for organisers. Um, but my, my friend Rebecca from Zambia made a poignant point at one of our COP26 events. And, and what she said was, and it really struck me, it is the minority we need to listen to right now, not the majority. Because before the majority even speak, they will be heard. And I think that's a crucial point. And, and it really reflected, uh, it made me reflect upon my time at COP. Um, and I suppose as well, every time I sit down and talk to policymakers and politicians, they eventually all say the same thing, that it's it's very difficult to make the changes um, that young people are, are urging and that we're seeking. I look at the COVID-19 crisis, and I think it's a prime example of how if you want to make the changes, you can. 30, over 38 countries dec have declared a climate emergency, but I'm yet to see any developed country tackle it with the same urgency and seriousness as our current health emergency. Um, but <laughs> besides the negativity of all of that, um, I don't agree with people that say that COP was a failure. Um, as my friend Rodrigo from Peru put it, it's not the blue zone that makes me hopeful, it is the friends and peers standing by my side. And what matters now and always has um, is what we do now. Do we give up or do we do our utmost to ensure that we save our planet and stop climate change because actually the earth will live on. The earth will continue um, long after we're gone. And the destruction we are causing is only making the planet, planet inhabitable for us humans. And currently we are on a suicide mission. My message to you all listening today is this, to the older generations, you are the past us and to the younger generations, we are the future you. So essentially what I'm saying is that we all have to work together to combat this. The finger pointing and the sector blaming has to end because we'll never create any progress if we're all pointing the finger and not actually um, combating the problem. And this can only be done if we actually work together. And, and I just want to end on a note that again, my friend Rodrigo from Peru said um, that this is not the final day of anything. It is just day one. And I hope, um, Young people are ready, so I hope everyone will join us in the journey ahead. Thank you very much, Elise, here for those remarks. Um, uh, and um, I think we'll come back to some of those themes um, in the course of the discussion, but thank you so much for the moment. Um, now to Dr. Sinead Walsh, uh, who is the Climate Director at, at the Department uh, of Foreign Affairs here in Dublin. Previously, Dr. Walsh was ambassador, EU ambassador to South Sudan. Prior to that, she was the Irish ambassador to Sierra Leone and Liberia. Dr. Walsh is the co-author of Getting to Zero, which recounts her experience as a diplomat on the front line of the Ebola crisis in West Africa. So huge, huge experience. I know um, plenty of insight. Sinead, you're very welcome this afternoon and we look forward to your opening remarks. Over to you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, really, really happy to be here. Um, if I was a bit savvier, I would have done what I used to do um, when I was in school and use my Irish name to get top of the alphabet with <laughs> Branagh rather than Walsh. Uh, I feel your I pain in that regard. I feel your pain. I'm always down the end as well. I will definitely make sure if I ever sit on a panel with Alicia again that I don't have to follow her for, for obvious reasons. So uh, well, well spoken, Alicia. Um, I, I also wanted to agree with Alicia that uh, that two weeks was, it just felt like a very long time. Uh, I, I don't know if, if people saw there was an Irish Times article, um, you know, about sort of immediately kind of 
after COP. And, and the first thing it said was, um, everyone looks seven years older than they did at the beginning. And I can testify, felt also seven years older. Um, so it, it was it was a, a marathon. Um, but I but I do I, I do agree with with what others have said. I think on the whole, uh, it was it was certainly um, you know productive and and constructive. Um, you know although uh, you know no, nowhere obviously near where where we need to be. Um, we, we had uh, Ireland had its largest delegation ever um, uh, led by by Minister Eamon Ryan, um, and and I'm sure. Lots of people on this call will have heard him him uh, kind of feedback on um, in the media on that sort of mixed uh, nature uh, of of the, the COP, but on the whole, um, you know, uh, moving us forward uh, in a way that you know you have to accept that when 197 countries have to agree on something, uh, you know, you're only going to get uh, you're only going to get so far. Um, I, I think what you know, I think um, others have have really kind of described it really well progress made on on kind of national commitments. Um, I think we're up to 89% of countries now that have made net zero commitments up from 50% in a year, as I understand it. Um, and I think people have talked about the, the declaration, you know, the non negotiation space methane deforestation and so on. So I, I won't I won't dwell on those, although I completely agree. Um, I'll touch uh, maybe on a couple of the areas where in, in foreign affairs we we kind of um, you know lead I suppose on on behalf of the government and they're mostly around um, climate finance and loss and damage which I think uh, you know Connie when you were saying that uh, you know I, I fully agree with you part of the reason why um, I suppose I would feel relatively positive about COP is probably because we were so aware how close we were to failing altogether, um, and, and I think loss and damage was one of those areas uh, where, where that was where that was at risk. Um, so, I mean, maybe just just to start on that. First of all, what is what is this loss and damage business? I mean, I think it's one I find easy way to to think about it or to start to think about it is, you know, climate impacts that are so bad that you can't even adapt to them, you know, because we talk a lot about adaptation and that's a really key, key priority for Ireland. But there are just some things, and I think, Alicia, you, you touched on some of them in terms of, you know, the submerging of the graves and so on. Like there is no economic way that you can get over, um, you know, that, that those sorts of impacts. And so I think loss and damage is really uh, an area that came you know, came to the fore in COP26, unlike uh, ever before, and was really the developing countries, you know, kind of standing up and saying, you know, this is this is not acceptable. You know, the impacts that we are facing are so severe, and we really need more more support. Um, and and I think the you know what was agreed. Uh, one of my colleagues was sort of in negotiations on this till 3 a.m. every day, starting again at seven. It was it was pretty it was pretty tough going. Um, but I think what was agreed in terms of, um, you know, starting the process of coming up with a finance facility and starting a technical assistance facility, which, which Ireland is, is going to chip into, frankly, it's further than we thought we were going to get. So much as, much as I think, uh, you know, definitely some, some developing countries um, would, have, would have wanted a, a lot more and, and, and we can completely understand that. So I think we need to really focus on you know and, and and i feel it's very consistent with ireland's values and and the areas you know that that we uh that we tend to focus on you know the poorest countries the most vulnerable countries the small island states and so on but we've got to really you know this has got to be a huge priority for cop 27 um, and just on, on on climate finance um i think a couple of really interesting things happened i mean connie is completely right as developed countries, we have not met our, our um, obligation uh, to 100 billion. Although I will say uh, on our side, um, our Taoiseach committed uh, at COP to more than doubling our climate finance in the next four years. So at least we, we, um, we're we going to be very uh, busy trying to, to chip into that, that gap uh, from, from our own uh, perspective. But I think, uh, you know, a, a couple of the really interesting things that happened and maybe I mentioned this maybe because it's not very well known, but the agreement with South Africa on, you know, the coal phase out, I don't know if, if everybody would, would be aware of that. It's not really one of the headlines, but you basically have the US, the EU, you know, France, the UK, a uh, couple of others, put it, pooling all sorts of uh, finance 
and making an agreement with South Africa. South Africa, you know, really needs to, to transition from coal. It's extremely difficult. We, we all know how difficult transition is. We know how difficult transition is if we look at our own Midlands in Ireland and we look at, at peat and, and the communities that have been so dependent on peat for, for so many years. So it's really difficult stuff. And I think what, what really strikes me about this, it's $8.5 billion um, and it's, it's people coming together and saying, okay, we're gonna have targeted support to help you with this precise thing. And I think this is what India, Indonesia and others have been asking for. They've been saying, you know, developed countries, you're always asking us, as you said, Connie, you know, developed countries are always asking us to reduce our emissions, but, you know, we are, we are very resource constrained and what are you going to do? And so I, I would just say that that South Africa agreement was, it is one to watch. And if it goes well, maybe one, one that we can replicate. Um, the last thing I'll say is just about the, the, um, the adaptation finance uh, commitment that, that got in, in the Glasgow agreement, uh, which actually I have to say was stronger than we expected it to be. So it's doubling collective adaptation finance by, by 2025. Uh, no problem for Ireland, it's already our, our big thing. Um, but I think what we'd like to, to focus on is, you know, quantity of course is really key, but we're, we're very um, keen to focus on the quality of that adaptation finance and the accessibility of it to, uh, to developing countries, because it's all very well having these big pots of money, but if there are 150 page application forms that cost you know, that mean that that a small island state has to, you know, hire four consultants and take six months to, to apply for, which is unfortunately the situation at the moment with some of the funds, then what's the point? So I think, you know, I think for Ireland, one of the things that we can do is maybe read a little bit behind some of these pledges and kind of say, okay, that sounds very nice, but actually in reality, what does that look like? And how can we, how can we sort of try to fill in some of those gaps? Um, so that you know these these kind of pledges are are a reality. So so I'll, I'll leave it at that, uh, Alex, uh, for now. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sinead. Um, I want to, Morgan, you, you mentioned, I think, at the outset, just about Glasgow and the, I think you used the word pomp or, you know, the sense of occasion and that can help, but it can also hinder, I think was your point. And Alicia, you made a great point that, look, when we reflect on Glasgow, it's not the final word. You know, when you would say to colleagues and, and friends who, who are disappointed, you know, legitimately. So we've got to see this as a as a place along the way. It's not the final, it's not the we haven't sort of arrived. It's a what's that other awful cliche? You know, it's a it's a marathon, not a sprint, all of those things, right? And I wonder, um, Morgan, maybe I ask you first, then come to Connie. The, the sense of a political occasion, and Connie, you'd be well aware, well familiar with the idea of you know the big political occasion, whether it's an election or whether it's something big domestically or internationally. Inevitably, that's where the focus comes. Um, and I wonder, in this agenda, is that it's, does it hold us back a little bit? Because we have to have this discussion: Did Glasgow fail, or did, or was Glasgow a success? And it comes down to this binary thing of a great occasion, a huge sort of pomp and ceremony. And was it a failure, or was it, or was it a success? It, it, it's, it's, it's not telling the whole story when we approach these single events and ask whether they're a failure or a success. I'll go to you, Morgan, first. Alex, with with respect, I'd like to defer to Commissioner Hedegaard on yeah. that one because she is the best person to uh, answer that Absolutely. question. Absolutely, Connie. Well, I don't know about that, but but uh, I think you know that yes, it means something that governments, heads of states themselves, since the first time where they had to stand up there in front of the world on climate, that was in Copenhagen in two thousand and nine, COP fifteen that helps that they know I'm personally going to Glasgow. They will look at me, they will ask, what is your government doing? My civil society, my NGOs, the activists in my country, the opposition in my country, they will all expect me there to come up with something. So that's the good side of it. I then just hope that after the COPs, now we need civil society and all the activists and the NGOs and all these good forces really to follow up on all these pledges, because we all know that in, at the UN, a lot is being pledged that is not really being delivered. And at least it's not being delivered as fast as it is promised to be delivered. 
So there is some, some built in dilemmas there, but I think that it is good that we have now made it chef Sache. It is for the top political level in a government to deal with climate change, and that is good. Having said that, and I really think that the cops have this role to mobilize political will, to expose political will and lack of political will, and that is good. But I think that now when the rule book is done, Paris is done, I think it's time to rethink the COP system slightly. What do I mean by that? It is so good that we mobilize people. What Alicia and others have been mentioning, you are there, there is a community around it, it focuses attention, all good. But it also does create false expectations that each year something fantastic new can be delivered. And that is unfortunately not the way the UN system works. So I think that now in light of Paris and the rule book being done, it should be considered whether the very big cops with heads of states and everybody flying in, whether that should be every other year. And then the years in between, maybe we should rather have a more thematic cop with fewer participants, but more experts zooming in on say, adaptation or a loss and damage one year or financing, how to mobilize private financing. Uh, you know, there are topics enough, there are obstacles enough where the, 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 the big chunks there, the big problems, they are so big and complicated that they do not get the attention they deserve at each COP, which is about everything. So maybe a rethink every other year, the big meetings with 20,000, 25,000, 30,000 people, and then maybe in between 5,000 people zooming in on some of the obstacles that we are struggling with. That could maybe be a recipe. It's an interesting question and dilemma because, of course, visibility is very important as well, so that world public opinion can see that world leaders are engaged on a continuing basis and not just year to year. So there's there, there, are, there are arguments, I'm sure, flowing in, in, in both directions. Morgan, do you want to come in on that, that point of momentum well, well, and the annual thing versus a longer term? Yeah, just to say, Alex, I was correct that uh, Connie was the right person to, to answer that question. But I, I, I would agree with that last piece. You know, I, I wrote a little uh, op-ed in the Financial Times before the before the event, um, speaking about the need to own in on those detailed negotiations and how th that pomp and celebrity can take away from it. And, and by the pomp and celebrity, I don't just mean famous actors and princess, uh, princesses. I, I mean, uh, even in some cases, heads of state and, in, 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 you know, that, that while it's excellent to have that convening power and show that commitment to the, to the task at hand, I agree that it doesn't have to be every time. And what, what happens, as many people on this call know, uh, when you go with the head of state or even with the minister, that you know there, there's a whole uh, constellation of people that have to move with that person and, 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 and do talking points and, and advise and all the rest of it. And it can take away from the sort of more uh, less... Uh, sexy work of, of, of actually doing the nego negotiations. And so there, there's a mix and, um, but there is a lot of pressure on host governments, of course, to have the big win and to have their name of the city or the country on some sort of a, a agreement. So the, there's a tensions in it, but um, I agree with everything Connie said. Alicia, I wonder from, from, from your perspective, I mean, you, you were there in Glasgow, uh, there were there was a discussion about whether youth voices really were being heard. I mean, we could see in the TV that there was a lot of presence there, but was the were, were voices getting through? I mean, for you and do you think for your generation, the people you represent, it is necessary to have a big event regularly so that in a way people are held to account on te on TV, like with the world gazing at. It? Um. Yeah, it's it's a tricky question. Like I, I, we did find ourselves in conversations being like, what is going on? Like, what is actually even happening here today? 
Um, and like obviously as well, it became increasingly difficult to get into actual negotiations because of COVID. So I, I do think, I do agree with Connie and I, I like the idea of something like that because I do think it was, there was too much happening at once. Um, and it was like we were trying to sort everything at once with everyone in the same place. And it was almost becoming um, too chaotic. And then obviously COVID just added to that. So I like the idea of, of that sort of um, every second year uh, or something like that, because I think, and I agree with that, uh, with Professor Morgan, that um, the, the, the show, and it's not just the celebrity, um, but I think it's the trying to do everything at once um, can lead to confusion and misunderstanding um, and a lot of frustration and actually people leaving COP with like 600 different variations of what happened, which I don't think is helpful at all uh, to, any, to any problem. So as a young person, I think I absolutely think that young people being there and public participation and civil society being there in some respect physically absolutely has to happen but I also think that to actually focus and and to create solutions to the real hard-hitting problems that that Connie mentioned you do have to have a, a scale back because I think we were just trying to do everything at once um and it and it becomes I think it becomes unfocused actually mm. and it's like I mean Having been in Lima and in Paris, and you know, you see these things that they're coming. The momentum is building, and you, you know, people are going in and out of rooms. It's just like you described, Alicia. Like, who even are these people, and what, what, what exactly did they just decide? Even if they hand you a piece of paper and you read it, what does that say? Like, if you're not confused, you're not paying attention, as the old phrase goes. So, I mean, everybody is, you know. And then there's a finally there's an agreement. But Sinead, I wonder what you think of this because. It's, it's an amazing event, really, in many ways. I mean, we've some of the drawbacks, attention has been drawn to some of the drawbacks, but it is an extraordinary event, literally under, under one single tent. Okay, it's not just one tent, but figuratively speaking. So it's the diplomacy is happening at a very high level, but it's also this really inspirational, very often civil society urge being, being met in the same place. And there's just so many things happening together. Would it be a pity to lose it? Or what do you say as a diplomat with experience of, of these events? Yeah, I'm a bit torn on this, Alex, to be honest, because I, I, I agree with Morgan that an enormous amount of energy of, you know, people like myself and, and, and my team will go into, you know, preparing ministers or, or the Taoiseach and so on and so forth, you know, for these kind of events. Um, at the same time, these events do push us further than we would go um and you know i don't just mean cop i mean i think this is just generally how 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 diplomacy often works it often is the event where you know the head of state will have to make a speech or your minister will be making a speech and you know they do push us in ireland and and, and other countries as well and, and that i suppose is, is one of the reasons why we keep doing them um i, I think the other aspect of it is that so much of, of, you know, for me, uh, and I agree with Alicia, there's so many different things happening and you, you feel like you're in this little tunnel and everybody else is in their own little tunnel and you don't know what's going on. You know, <laughs> often you'd get news, you know, from, you get a text message from home from somebody saying, isn't that great what John <laughs> Kerry just said? And you're like, I have no idea what John Kerry just said. I've been in a loss and damage conversation at a very micro level. Um, but but I think we, we have to remember that Actually, a big benefit of COP is the conversation that it generates back home. Fundamentally, we've got to remember that climate action will take place in domestic contexts, in domestic political mm. arenas. And, mm. you know, that's a 12 month, um, you know, challenge for for all of us. Um, and and it's, it doesn't just happen in two weeks, but those two weeks, I mean, certainly in the Irish context, I mean, the coverage in the media for COP was extraordinary, uh, I, I would say. Um, and so, so, and all sorts of different, you know, panels like this were taking place and, and you know, people in schools and so on and so forth. So there's that aspect of it as well. Um, the protests, you know, were, were, I think, you know, really important. Again, you know, they're different to the negotiations. So I, I, I think we, we need to see COP as, as a negotiation space, but also as a moment that can help mobilize and also at a, a moment that can 
help domestic actors um, mm. and domestic activists. And, and um, you know, so, so that maybe, <laughs> maybe complicates the picture a little bit. Um, but I, I also do, uh, that's why I say I'm a bit torn because that, you know, Connie's suggestion really does also resonate with me that maybe we don't need to have the big hullabaloo every year you know, maybe every, every, every second year. And the only other thing I wanted to say here, Alex, just because I think it's so important, um, it is worrying the participation, you know, aspect of it. I mean, we, we, we had a bunch of civil society on our, uh, uh, and academics on our Irish delegation, but we also funded, you know, youth and, and women uh, activists from, from various developing countries to come. And, you know, kind of talking to them on a daily basis, real limitations to access and, we absolutely, I think, have to acknowledge the UK had enormous COVID challenges and all of this, but let's hope it doesn't set a precedent, right? That, you know, that that now is a new baseline, because I think that is one of the, that is one of the possible advantages of COP is, is the voices that it brings, it brings in. But, but I mean, to, 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 to sum up, I do think Connie's, uh, Connie's idea, I think does, does merit some, some good solid uh, uh, consideration. All right. I was very struck, Connie, by your reference to India, that that, that was something that really st stood out for you um, in Glasgow, that that was something that perhaps you, you hadn't expected. Um, and because, of course, a lot of the um, a lot of the commentary or the narrative w w wasn't particularly favorable to to India and India's position. But in fact, you've singled what they said and what they did out as being a cause for optimism, as a cause for you know a positive response. Uh, so, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? And we might talk a little bit about China in a minute as well with Morgan. Yeah, Alex, I think it's because I've seen so many cops where in the last twenty four hours in the last plenaries we have been sort of up against sort of basic China, Brazil, South Africa, India, being against ambitious language. It was not their problem. They were developing countries. It was the developed world who had created their problems, which is of course true, but they sort of stood back and said, we don't want this kind of language. And, and really often uh, the Chinese, to be very blunt, they had just kept silent during these plenaries, just sitting there and looking straight forward, not taking the blame, not taking the battle, and left that to the Indian ministers, to changing Indian ministers. So that has often been the role we have seen India sort of having in these talks. And then suddenly Prime Minister Modi comes there and he really uh, weighs in and say, okay, this is also for us. We still have 300 million people without access to electricity. Nonetheless, we are saying that by 2070, we want to become carbon neutral. And eight years from now, at least half of our electricity will stem from renewables. I thought that, you know, we don't know, we haven't got the exact detailed plans. Can they actually achieve this? We don't know. But the fact, the political fact that they weighed in there, I thought that was really, really interesting. And, and I think that that is also somehow maybe changing the dynamic among the emerging economies. And indirectly, it can also help making some of the push further needed for China, for instance, to fast forward the year when they want to peak their emissions. Because I guess that some of us had really hoped that China would fast forward that date from 2030 to 2025, which many scientists also at Chinese universities would tell us should be feasible for China. I think some of us had hoped that they would come forward with that announcement now here in, in Glasgow, which they didn't. But one could hope that should the dialogue between US and China actually come to some fruitful results, and mm. such a thing could be among the deliverables coming out of that dialogue that will take place before the next COP in, in Egypt. Very interesting. Um, Morgan, the, the US-China joint declaration that, that, that was made, how, how do you assess that? Is that, you know, what kind of impact do you think that's going to have? Just picking up from what Connie was saying there in a way that these kinds of initiatives can drive further initiatives. They're not just standing on their own. They, they're a great signal as well to others to follow. Yeah, I, I think that the 
the the the one of the successes, as I said, of this COP was outside of the negotiating table in these coalitions. And while they do not have binding targets and they're not legally enforceable in any way, um, they're significant. And and I mentioned the methane pledge, as did others. Um, that has now um, been taken, at least in the US, uh, into domestic policy. So the domestic uh, EPA here in, in, in the United States has put out a proposed rulemaking uh, around methane emissions to significantly decrease them, especially in the oil and gas sector. So what we saw was international coalition uh, moving into domestic policy, which um, I mentioned has happened in Ireland and other ways, but in the United States, that that is uh, no small feat. And so I think the, the, those outside coalitions can be really important and building you know, on the on the India piece, if you don't mind, Alex, um, yes, I course, thought that please. I thought that was I thought that was more significant than the China U.S. agreement, in as much as you know, immediately after the uh, uh, Modi made the announcement about the net zero, um, there was criticism, which I was surprised about because of uh, the the year in which uh, the the goal was set. I think that is deeply misplaced criticism, and the fact that there was a goal at all is is, is really significant and and shows um, something really important. Momentum, um, one of those uh, un, un, unmeasurables at the climate talks, but something that's really important for for soft power or however you want to call it in international relations. Um, the the U.S. China agreement. Um, the paper is. Uh, it, I think it's nice that there was uh, there was something there that there was acknowledgement by the world's two largest emitters that they were going to work together in some way that they had a special uh, need to, to take ownership over this problem. Um, you know, years ago, uh, before um, Paris, I traveled to China with then uh, Todd Stern, who was the climate envoy under President Obama in the United States for those secret uh, climate talks between the United States and China. And th those were covered actually in the Rolling Stone uh, without my name, which is too bad. But uh, the, the, um, I thought that diplomacy, which was much more uh, lower level, quiet uh, diplomacy was actually perhaps more effective than this very high level statement, which is, um, uh, lacking in, in detail, but okay, uh, useful nonetheless. Okay, thank you both for that. And Alicia and Sinead, I'm going to come to you in a couple of minutes, but uh, Connie does need, does have to leave us at the top of the hour. So there is a question here, Connie, I'd just like to ask you maybe to, to address. It's Christian uh, Ritamal. Um, who, who says that considering the current updated NCDs, the main portion of the remaining carbon budget for 1.5 is still being consumed by developed and industrialized countries. Considering such emissions projections, how do you foresee the global stock take might address the equity issue in regard to implementing Paris? Yeah, that is, of course, the question, how, how to do that. I, I do think that we will never manage to uh, close the gap unless everybody try to pursue a, a, a much more sustainable pathway. So I think that what developed countries will have to do, they will have to sort of go first and do more and be committed to more than, than others. But then it has to come also through the financing. That was why I mentioned first financing. Of course, not just public financing. That is just a tiny drop in the ocean important, politically important, but also important for adaptation. But, but uh, the real important stuff is how to get private investments really uh, going into you know, African countries, the most vulnerable countries, all the countries where there is an additional risk to be had. And I think that that is one of the really, really big challenges now. Uh, there were good signs also in Glasgow uh, I know, for instance, the, the Nordic pension funds now work together and, and, and it sums up to, you know, 
hundreds of billions of dollars that they are risk investing in, in developing countries. But I think we really need to scale significantly there, help with enabling uh, technologies, help setting up stronger ministries. I know that there is an EU African initiative, for instance, to sort of put up a African EU African School of Re Regulation, things like that. Not not all of it rocket science, but simply how do you do this and how do we disseminate the good technologies and the practices much faster than is the case. I think that that is very much needed. And that is why I come back to the fact that financing is also at the core of, of this whole thing, or we will not make it. Mm -hmm. And just because I'm conscious that um, we need to let you go in a couple of minutes, I, I again, Morgan, mentioned something earlier, I made a note of it, um, at least I think it was Morgan, it may have been Sinead, but I think it was Morgan was early on, um, the need to, to, to strive for globally binding commitments. So that's a phrase that we need to, I suppose, interrogate a little bit, because at the international level, where we're talking about treaties and international agreements, there's precious little kind of real enforceability that we can bring about. It's all, it's, it's about agreement. It's about agreements, it's about a willingness to keep to agreements. It's not like as in our domestic legal orders where if people don't keep to their agreements um, or if governments don't do what they're supposed to do, they can sometimes be brought to court. So will we always be limited by the absence of in real enforcement mechanisms as we would understand them in our domestic legal orders? Will we always be limited in that way on the international stage? Alex, I'm, fr um, I'm really afraid that the answer is yes, but I guess that some in the audience will remember that up to COP15 in Copenhagen that I was very much involved in, that mm. was exactly what, that was what Copenhagen was all about. We tried to get a legally binding agreement. And, and, and that was of course what was needed. Needless to say, that is better than having, you know, just voluntary commitments that nobody really can come after. I know there is a whole philosophical discussion. What does it mean that it's voluntary because you cannot bind anybody in the international community? So does it really make a difference? But what we tried to do back in 2009, that was to have a much more legally binding, transparent international uh, deal. But what turned out was that it was not achievable. Uh, Many of the big economists don't have to mention who, I guess, they did not want the tra transparency coming with that, that they did not at all like the binding nature. And that was why we had to work in the years up to Paris to try to construct something on the basis of a voluntary system where at least now we got the transparency and the rule book, but we also now have this ambition mechanism where at regular times we will have to look each other into the eyes mm -hmm. and so sort of you have to stand up and be accountable to whether you have delivered what you pledged to deliver so the only thing we have sort of left is naming and shaming civil society really you know pushing governments as much as they can so that's the kind of tools we have it's not ideal but I think that the honest answer is that that is what we are going to have for a foreseeable future. Just last point, I think that what EU is trying to do with the CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, the pricing instrument, things like that can also be a rather efficient tool if it's done in the right manner to try to push other economies also to now, now to implement real efficient climate policies. Connie Hedegaard, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. I know you have Thank another you. commitment at the top of the hour. It's been terrific to have you. Um, and um, hope we'll see you again at the IEA in some, some point. Thank you for having me. To, to distant future. Thank you very Thank much. You. Sinead, just briefly, would you would you pick up on that, just that notion of how do we make things happen? Like how do we, again, as a diplomat, you know, people make commitments. Uh, the public gaze, the, the global gaze is there. Is that is that the enforcement mechanism, ultimately? Yeah, I, um, I, I think, I, and, and maybe this, I think there's a question in the in the chat about this. I think, as I said earlier, Alex, the, you know, our systems, are, you know, as governments, our systems do 
do move uh, in general with with peer pressure. And I think I think we can see that, um, you know, that is is maybe more, uh, you know, it, 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 it does, of course, vary by country. But I think the COP processes can show us that that all countries feel that way to some extent. But I also wanted to come back to the, the point about, um, you know, domestic domestic um, activism, because, you know, fundamentally, you know, you, you come back from COP, everybody comes back from COP to a country, right? Almost mm -hmm. everybody, right? There's some stateless people, but let's leave that aside for the moment. Big problem. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and in each of those countries, there's a whole series of, you know, challenges because this is such a fundamental shift and transformation in our in our way of life. Um, and so I, I think th there is really only so much that these international processes um, can do. And I think, um, you know, in the end of the day, you know, the progress will be made um, at the country level. So then the question becomes, uh, how is that kind of best done? And, and then I suppose the question for, you know, activists, you know, such, such as Alicia and so on is, you know, to what extent, it comes back to kind of Connie's very interesting proposal, to what extent are these uh, international processes, um, you know, helpful in that, in that domestic, um, you know, kind of journey, and to what extent are they maybe distractions if they happen too, too, uh, too often. Um, but, but I think coming back to the, um, the question in the chat, I think Pauline um, Conway may have, may have asked it, um, we haven't really, you know, uh, talked too much about about the rather, I think, surprising and and significant fact that, you know, there will be, um, you know, another, uh, you know, in, in one year, in one year's time, not five years, not 10 years, uh, there will be another call for uh, for increased uh, commitments. And I think, you know, you know, to a lot of us that that is, uh, you know, one of the, the biggest um uh, positives from uh, from COP because you know at, at the very very best case scenario if if every single country commitment is 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 uh, realized on time and if every single declaration is hundred percent realized on time and you know we all we all know enough I think to be to be skeptical um, we're still looking at one point eight and and one point eight you know, I think you can say goodbye to to some some entire uh, island island states, for example, and 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 um, you know the consequences. Um, you know, I think we all know, uh, particularly for for a lot of uh, you know kind of resource poor countries are, are just going to be devastating. So um, so yeah, I, I think I, I'm I'm quite encouraged by that uh, by that check in, um, but I think we just also have to be realistic that. Most of this progress uh, will will happen uh, in in domestic situations, and and how how can we facilitate that? Thank you. There's an interesting question here from Caroline White and Alicia. I'll I'll put it to you because you you might want to pick up on that that issue there that we were touching on in terms of um, how you enforce how you make things happen and the value and the importance of activism on, on a continuing uh, basis. But Caroline White thanking us for, for the webinar. She's a, a question uh, for any one of the, the, the panelists, really. She says, given the challenge uh, that has been described of ensuring that climate adaptation funds actually get to the people and projects uh, where they're needed, as Sinead has been uh, speaking about earlier, has there been much investigation into the potential role that could be played by per capita cash transfers or participatory budgeting in climate adaptation uh, in global South countries. So I suppose it's, it's, it's this Caroline uh, White at FASTA. Um, it, so it's it's you know ensuring that uh, the the I suppose the actual specifics are implemented in terms of money that's promised, that's pledged by countries at the COPs to really get that through to. Uh, the places where, where 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 it's needed internationally. So I suppose, Alicia, for you, the two things you can pick one or other or both, the activism point or the um, the finance point. Or well, both. I think um, probably Sinead is definitely best suited to to answer that specific um, issue. Um, but I will say is is that I suppose at my time at COP, um, I and like I kind of mentioned in what I said at the beginning, I really tried to focus on going to events about small island nations and mm. people from indigenous communities and I did that because I kind of thought well if I walk into some sort of climate finance um, talk I'm not going to understand any of it anyway um, and I'll probably leave more confused than if I ever didn't go in 
Um, so, and, and as well, it wasn't just that, but it was that um, it was the one opportunity where I was firsthand able to listen to these groups of people and listen to what they needed. And they actually have a lot of solutions. And I was at an event with Mary Robinson and it was actually about I think it was about climate financing in some respect. Um, but my understanding is that there's still a lot of barriers to even if the money is there and even with all these pledges and maybe Sinead can pick up on this in a minute uh, if I'm right. Um, but e even if with all these pledges of giving the money, which thankfully now we've kind of got, um, there's still a lot of barriers for these countries in actually accessing the money and 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 it, and using the money. Um, so that's that's a, like a huge issue that I, again I think we we think oh the money is there but actually are those people getting the money at the end of the day um, and maybe Sinead can can weigh in. Yeah, I'll come back to Sinead, but I do want to ask Morgan because as I mentioned um, earlier, um, you, you've now got an involvement um, in the Irish um, debate and the Irish public policy uh, um, space now in respect of the uh, your, your membership of the uh, Climate Change Advisory Council appointed that by the government, by the minister, Minister Ryan, in recent times. So I know you're familiar with Ireland, um, but I, I, do you have any particular insights into where Ireland as a relatively small country and a relatively small player, but I think a, an influential one, um, frankly, that the, where, where Ireland stands in all of this internationally, because you're in a good position to view us from abroad and now that you're going to be working here as well. Yeah, Alex, a, a little bit of a loaded question. I, I, I think, <laughs> um, you know, rather than wasn't intended that to be loaded. It wasn't intended to be loaded. I promise you, but I can see how it might have been received. That I, ha I haven't been in the Irish papers in some time until recently for for issues related. So, um, uh, you know, Alex, what I, what I think is that uh, I said in my opening remarks, and I meant it that, you know, the the work that is taking place in Ireland, which is difficult politically, which is difficult from a even from an analysis and research perspective, um, and it is certainly painful to different parts of, 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 of the country and the sectors, it is the real work. And the fact that Ireland is getting on with it, uh, warts and all, as we say, um, I, I think is really important uh, globally. Uh, that is, it is relatively simple and expedient politically to announce uh, political targets decades in the future, as we as we all know. Um, and and now, it, while it's a good thing that uh, many, most of the large economies in the world and smaller economies in the world have these net zero targets for mid-century, it's it's really not the difficult work, and and that does happen on the domestic front with with, with all of those uh, tensions, and you have those tensions in Ireland. Uh, we have them in the United States very clearly, um, and, and so I think I think what I said at the beginning was you can be proud that that hard work is underway. No, it won't go completely smoothly, and there'll be all kinds of setbacks and. Uh, uh, messiness, but the fact that it's un ongoing is really important, and and there has been wins, and I think, you know, it, it, so, some of the things that uh, ESB has done in in the past have been really world leading as far as getting, um, you know, high amounts of renewable energy integrated into a grid. A very technical question, but one that that that, that is important, and and the work the myriad policies that are that are underway. So I, I think there's a lot lot going on, a lot to be proud of. And importantly, and, and as uh, Sinead can say much uh, better than I, uh, also a leader internationally. And so while the, the, the amount of that money is not comparable to the large, larger economies, the certainly the percentages are, and the leadership in places like the Security Council over the last year and a half or so, I think has been deeply significant, and people have seen Ireland as a, as a real leader because of because of that work. So I, I mostly have positive things to say uh, in that front. 
And you've got some people on the call here. Remember, Fergal McNamara remembers you at the IIEA in 2005 um, when you were reporting on the then meetings of the parties um, ahead of uh, ratification um, of the Framework Convention. So that's some time ago. Um, and he, he wants you to take a longer view of the COP process, but we've kind of touched on that, that debate um, we've sort of touched on that debate already, but as I said, you have you have plenty of people who uh, remember you and uh, admire you and look forward to working with you here in the period ahead. Um, Sinead, I think I do want to come back to the to the finance to broadly. You know, the loss and damage, um, for example, one of the I suppose the hitches are the things that didn't work out. Um, but the broader question of finance commitments, the equity issue. Um, and you know the climate fund. I'm going to make an admi a public admission here, um, which is that one of the uh, uh, sort of relatively short period in politics and had highs and lows that people will appreciate. But I have to say that one of the lows was um, our position, which I was there to articulate um, in 2014 in Lima. Um, when I represented Ireland, when really our position on the climate finance was very poor. Uh, and I think I'm I think I'm qualified to say that because I was the person who was there having to having to communicate it. Um, and it was, you know, it was embarrassing with it with it with a capital E, to be honest. Now, things have definitely moved, as you have described briefly earlier. Um, Mary Robinson was there at the time. You know, Mary Robinson is such a key player and, and so on. And it, you know, it's it's it it has it has evolved in a very positive way since. So from again from the point of view of how Ireland is seen in the diplomatic uh, uh, context on this finance question, okay, relatively small country, it, it it must be helping how we're seen the fact that we have upped our game with money. Our yeah. Pledges. No. Look, I think. Uh... I think 140% increase uh, in, in four yeah. years. I don't think anybody can sneeze at that. I mean, you know, uh, it, it, is, it is really, really significant. The challenge that we're going to have, and we're actually, we're working on a kind of a roadmap at the moment across, across government um, and kind of with inputs from civil society and so on, is how do we do that maintaining the quality? Because what a lot of... Um, you know, countries do, and and you know, we 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 also invest in some of these funds. But a lot of countries, when it comes up to something like COP, um, you know, there's these big global funds that exist, and and the, you know, you know, one one way to quickly spend money is to you know add lots more millions into this fund and that fund and the other fund, and I think there is an efficiency to that because we all need to make you know these global funds are you know they they. They're very serious players, and you know there's an efficiency to saying you know we'll be part of that, and then we'll we'll sit on the board of that fund, which we do, for example, for the for the for the global uh, for the Green Climate Fund, and you know we we, we share a seat on that, and then we, we try to make the fund better. Um, but I think it would be a mistake to put all of our money into those kind of big um, global funds because. Coming back to something uh, that you know that Alicia talked about and, and that question about um, adaptation finance, like this stuff is not easy, right? I mean, we've been working for um, you know almost fifty years in the Irish Aid Program, you know, mm -hmm. on on poverty, and one of the things I find kind of extraordinary because you know I kind of spent twenty years working in in sort of international development and and, and emergencies and so on, and now I'm I'm in the climate world. And it's almost sometimes as if, as if the, the expenditure in the climate world is happening in parallel, even though it's happening in the same countries and many, many cases on the same sectors. So it's like, well, climate adaptation, well, what is climate adaptation? Well, often it's agriculture work. I mean, it's, it's not some new magic thing. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the advantages we have is because we sit inside the Irish aid program, we can bring some of those lessons. You know, yeah. here's what we found over the last 50 years is really difficult in terms of, you know, supporting health systems, for example, just to pick something topical in, um, in, in, in you know, some of the most sort of difficult and, and you know, poor and conflict affected countries. Our climate finance is not gonna be any easier than our development and humanitarian finance. We've got to use these lessons. And I think the value that Ireland can add is, is to kind of get below or beyond some of the 
again, blah, 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 like the sort of rhetoric and the big announcements and so on, and actually ask the question, but what does that actually look like in Katakui in Eastern Uganda? Um, and so I, I think, you know, that, that is the, you know, I think that is what we can add. And, and you know, it's a bit challenging because you, you obviously, it, you need, you know, you need the resources for that. You need the, the, the staff and, and the minds around, around the table. Uh, but we've we've made some progress there as well. We, we've we've kind of increased our, our staffing, and I know for Department of Environment as well. So so I think um, I think that is what we what we need to do. And I think that's kind of where we're known in general in Ireland is we often sort of put up our hands and ask the awkward question and and try to get you know beyond the um, you know the the the, the talk uh, as it were. So I think we need to continue uh, to do that and and again bring bring the lessons from you know, almost 50 years of Irish aid to to climate expenditure, because you know what, it's it's pretty similar stuff. Interesting. Um, there's a couple of questions. There's one I'll just I, I may get a chance to come back to you, Sinead, on it. Uh, Connor Galvin, UCD, um, if you'd say some, a little some, something a little more about the technical assistance facility. And I will come back to you in a moment. If you just uh, uh, kind of bank that for the moment, but just as if just reflecting what you have been saying and indeed Morgan before you, two questions which I think I'm going to I'm going to put them out as as comments, but they they are actually questions. So if anybody on the panel would like to answer them, but they're as much assertions as they are questions about where we are in terms of policy here. Um, Raj Tuari says. Why asks why the Irish government is not promoting and incentivizing shared mobility in the community to reduce the number of cars on the road and ultimately to reduce carbon emissions. This piece was kind of missing from Climate Action Plan 2021. Deborah McDermott um, is not sure whether this is in the wheelhouse of any of the presenters. I like that phrase, is it in the wheelhouse of any of the presenters? But she's going to ask it anyway. With methane, so, I'm quite right too, with methane such an important part of this COP, uh, Deborah is really curious how Ireland in reality on the ground is going to meet its methane targets given the importance of agriculture in this country too. So there are questions to some extent uh, rhetorical, but they are questions of of considerable substance and moment, obviously, in terms of the broader debate that we're that that we're that we're in. So, briefly on the technical assistance uh, facility, don't 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 be shy by picking up either those other two points as well, Sinead, if, if you want, um, agriculture and transport. But if just keep that tight, and then just the technical assistance, and then I want to go on to some of the other questions as well. Thanks, just a Alex. minute. Or yeah, I mean, I, I actually think this, this, there's maybe an opportunity to, to, to make a point that keeps coming into my head, um, you know, thinking about, you know, that, that um, you know, those two, those two questions. And again, you know, I'm, I'm in foreign affairs, so I, I'm not the best person to give detailed answers on them. That would be Department of Environment uh, or Agriculture, indeed. But I think the, the, the issue about co-benefits is something that we, we haven't really touched on, and I think it's really crucial. So, you know, like, you know, farmers, for example, you know, all over the country, you hear um, it's not just about climate. There are also, you know, pollution related benefits. There are also sometimes, you know, like new markets if you, if you, you know, maybe go into organics or different things. So there's different ways to, to look at the climate uh, challenge. And I think that's so powerful because, you know, generally, you know, people are trying to make a living, you know, nobody sort of wakes up in the morning and says, I want to do bad stuff for the climate, right? Everybody wants to do good stuff for the climate. But, you know, we, we have, we all have these, these habits uh, of lives and livelihoods. And so, you know, thinking about, for example, um, you know, the high rates of asthma in, in this country and, and bringing that into the conversation, um, not just, you know, the sort of climate impacts of the transport sector, for example, but you know the health, the health benefits. So I, I just think that's that's just something important yep. for us to, to bear in mind. But unconscious time is is, is short. And um, yep. on the technical assistance facility, um, basically just to say it's it's called the Santiago facility. Um, we, along with uh, DEC, we have pledged uh, five million euros uh, to this. It's basically going to try to help developing countries um, deal with the issue of loss and damage. Um, so there's. There's one conversation about the kind of the finance to do that, and this is the conversation about the expertise to do that. So, so and, and we're 
we're interested in supporting both of those tracks, but the one that's further ahead at the moment is the technical assistance. So we've we've pledged money, but it's it's only now getting started. So I, I don't have so much more to say about it. Well, that's really helpful. Thank you. Kevin O'Sullivan of the Irish Times has a question that I'm going to go to um, Morgan and then Alicia, in fact, all, all three of you. Uh, Kevin asks, uh, 2021 has been a year of climate progress confirmed by the imperfect outcome at COP26. Is the problem now an issue of pace? We are winning. We are just not winning fast enough. What can be done to improve the pace of delivery on commitments? That's Kevin O'Sullivan. And first to you, Morgan, if I may, on that. Sure. Kevin, it's, a, it's, it's an excellent question. He knows very well. It's a, a very difficult question to answer. I, I'll put it this way. You know, the, the optimistic tone of the question uh, is lovely, of course. But, uh, you know, where I'm sitting right now in the United States, uh, we're, we're, as the world's largest producer of oil and gas, we note that uh, just in the past couple of weeks, the global oil demand has rebounded back to pre-COVID levels of, of, of about 100 million barrels a day. Um, there's increased use of coal recently because of the European and Asian energy crisis that's ongoing. Um, and so it's it's not at all clear to me that uh, uh, the direction of travel is even in the right place. So yes, there is a magnificent strides being made in electricity and, and power markets globally around renewable energy, and that's significant and, and going in the right direction. There is a good progress on, say, things like electric vehicles. Um, but in, in the very short term, that, that uh, lowered emissions we saw from the response to the global pandemic uh, appears to be a blip and does not appear to be a, a sustained uh, downward trend. And so, you know, the, the, the question is always one of pace and scale. And uh, if anyone had the answer to that question, I'd love to hear it. I, I, I don't think they do. It, I'm afraid it's going to be a piecemeal approach, country by country, region by region, um, and we'll take the wins where we can get them. And going to that methane question, uh, the methane piece is a real opportunity to make a short-term win for the climate, uh, also in, in some places for uh, air pollution. And I do see real progress being made uh, in the big producing countries like the United States uh, on those issues. So there's there is positive as well. Alicia, would you like to um, just agree or disagree with that notion that it's about pace? So all sorts of questions about goodwill. Are people serious? Are they doing enough? Are they living up to their previous commitments? All of those questions that can be turned into criticisms of where, 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 where appropriate. But what Kevin O'Sullivan is, is saying, he's putting it this way, that it's about pace. We are winning but we are just not winning fast enough. Would you embrace that as a description of where we are? Um, it's a difficult one. Um, I, like, I suppose from my perspective, um, and I, I hate to be too negative as well, because I think, um, and you know, I don't like this notion of not having any, having any hope, because I think if we don't have hope, then what's the bloody point? Um, yeah. But, just something that I would note um, in terms of what we're doing or what people can do. I think often we're turning to governments and at the end of the day, yes, they make the decisions and they make the policies, but it's us that they represent. It's us who votes them. You know, I know that sounds so simple now, but um, they represent us as civil society. And I think it's a what they do is a reflection of what we want. Um, and I think it's crucial that, and it goes back to the point I made earlier that, you know, that we're doing what we can do within our own power so i'm a young person i'm a student in university i'm a citizen of ireland um you know i'm part of the eu so like what are the things i can do within each of those um with each of those hats per se um that that can that can push and drive change in each of those um areas and 
one of the things I'd mention um, is Climate Case Ireland, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, Alex, which was a hu of huge significance and was just a group of uh, of a community of people in Ireland who decided to take the Irish government to court um, and, and they won. And it's happening all across the world. So, I mean, that's that's obviously a, a big kind of example, but and it's not the only one uh, internationally, of course, but I think we can, it just goes to show what you can do in your different, um, you know, seats you sit in in society. And it's not just about plastic straws or uh, having an electric car. Um, there's various ways you can, you, can, uh, you can drive the force going forward. But in terms of the question, I think we are moving, of course we're moving, um, but we just have to continue that the drive is in the right direction. Um, and and that, that I suppose that we're being continued to be heard um, at all levels. Thank you. Sinead, do you like Kevin's characterization of it? We're, we're winning, we're just not winning fast enough? Well, we don't know yet, do we? Because if we don't win fast enough, we lose. So, <laughs> and we lose big. So, yeah, um, yeah I think as, as Morgan said, it's, uh, I, I'd love to, I, 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 yeah, I certainly hope that's that's the case. I think I think we all do, but, um, and, and I think it comes back, I, I think, uh, uh, Philip Edger Hayes uh, talked about, you know, it was both a good cop and a bad cop at the same time. And, and it's it's this whole thing. Yeah. Of, well, are you thinking of it as, you know, relative to the urgency? Of course, it was a terrible cop, you know, because we're nowhere near where we need to be. But relative to where we were before, then, you know, it's definitely a step forward. So I think it just it comes back to that same dilemma. Mm -hmm. um, Tara Kelly of the ESB. Um, apologizes in advance that it might be an oversimplification but she's about to say but it's not at all an oversimplification i think she says look money that it, it, decarbonization costs money money that some country countries either do not want to part with or cannot afford to part with how can we make decarbonization worth paying for carbon tax question mark legislating triple bottom line and environmental social and governance esg reporting can we learn from the shortcomings and build on the carbon credit system again these are these are questions i suppose about the the de the, the the detail of, of of policy as it plays out um I, I, i'm conscious obviously Sinead, you're dealing with this at the level of 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 the the diplomatic input uh, um, but, but obviously with it with, it, with an interest in, in, in what can be achieved domestically as well um the carbon tax actually on on carbon tax morgan do, do you do you have anything observation to make as the as between the US and we'll say the ES, US and the EU on this question of carbon tax and the completely the rather different approaches taken by, the, you know, on those on that kind of high level policy approach to incentivizing decarbonization. Yeah, look, Alex, uh, the discussion about uh, carbon tax, uh, uh, as they say in the American West, is like beating a dead horse. It's uh, um, it's it's um, it's been around the block many times. It is. Um, it rises and falls in its political possibilities over, for, for very different reasons over different time frames and different political politics. Um, it's fundamentally political in, everywhere, but especially in the United States, where we hate to use the word taxes um, for anything. And so, you know, you can put them in. A carbon tax in another name, or the, the the devil in the detail, whether you do a price mechanism or a quantity mechanism. Um, in the U.S. currently, it was long long thought to be dead, and then it raised up recently in the context of some some uh, budget um, negotiations that were happening. So it, it's pretty hard to say, but I don't see um, what the economists always ask for from a theoretical perspective, as you know, as a low start rising continuously and across the economy uh taking care of re the regressive nature of uh, of a tax etc the sort of perfectly designed policy and alex you would know uh, uh, as well or better than most of us how <laughs> the, the the likelihood of putting in a beautifully designed thoughtful policy through a political process is uh well nearly impossible so uh, at least in the U.S., that's where it stands. I, I, I won't uh, go into the EU because I, I think others on the call have a better sense of it. OK, well, it might have to be um, part of our continuing discussion for the future because we've come to 
to the end of this really interesting and stimulating uh, debate and discussion. And I want to thank um, each, each one of our, our panelists, um, Morgan Bazilian, uh, um, Alicia O'Sullivan, um, and Sinead uh, Walsh, and also earlier, um, um, Connie Hedegaard. Uh, each one of you for uh, joining with us uh, this afternoon, for giving us your insights, being prepared to answer the questions, address the issues. It's a continuing debate. If COP is continuing, our debate is as well, and um, will into the future. Uh, um, I want to thank, again, warmly thank the ESB and Paddy Hayes for um, his introductory remarks, for his support and the ESB's support with this series. But um, most of all, I want to thank those of you, many of you uh, in your hundreds who, who um, uh, booked in for this uh, session and have stayed with us right to the end. Many of you, 100 or so, have stayed with us all the way to the end. Uh, so you've obviously found it stimulating. I certainly have. Thank you all to the panelists. Thank you, everybody who participated. And have a good rest of the day and mind that storm. <laughs>